I'd like to do something a little bit different. I know I've done this a time before, some of you might recall. Um, someone has put this passage of scripture to um, a tune. Uh, in fact, I heard this uh, 39 years ago when I was in Bible school, and uh, this man put it to tune, and it's stayed with me ever since. Such a lovely way of remembering the word of God is to sing it. And you can actually sing these verses. And so I'd invite you to sing along with me as much as you won't know the tune, maybe, but you'll pick it up. It's very simple. Uh, and we'll just sing it a cappella. Uh, and um, it's the, the words of 2 Timothy 3 from verse 14 through 17. So bear with me. I'll, uh, you, you kind of catch the tune. We might sing it through a couple of times. Uh, it's a good way to remember the word of God. It's to put it to a tune. And, uh, of course, I'd, I'd love to meet this fellow again. I don't know where he is now, but uh, I'm sure he's put other scriptures to, to a tune as well, and it's a great way of getting it in your heart. So uh, feel free to, to join along with me if you, if you feel brave enough. Uh, just sort of catch the tune as we go uh, together. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Thrilly furnished unto all good works. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect truly furnished unto all good works amen let's pray lord we thank you for your word as we gather unto it now lord be lifted up and bless each one lord may our ears be ears that hear your word and hear what you would have us to know and understand that we might grow thereby. In Jesus' name, amen. The Word of God, the Word of God. We live in a world that there's much fake things around, isn't there? The, the fake, the fake uh, seems to be overtaking things. You know, kids these days, they, um, I, I saw, see on the back of buses, they've got these virtual reality goggles on. <laughs> it's all virtual reality now, not the, not the reality. It's a, a virtual, a fake reality. There's fake news, there's fake religion. There's fake preachers. Everything is getting broken down, it seems. And I got this quote I read lately. It said, The sole purpose for breaking down culture, history, tradition, family, faith, morality, gender, the rule of law, and everything that represents is in order to collapse society. And the sole agenda of this is the modus operandi of Marxism. Um, Bracket, political atheism, bracket. Marxism 101, and the enemies are inside the gates. Now, everything is being broken down. You see the news? It's just like chaos, isn't it? The bedrock of society is being undermined. 
There's rioting in the streets. They're overturning everything, trying to pull down statues, uh, trying to rewrite history, as it were. This is a world where it seems like there's no rules, no God in their mind, no responsibility, no work ethic, no accountability, no hope. People want no law, no police, no government. Uh, Imagine... (laughs) Maybe uh, some governments uh, might need unseating, but there's, need for need, there's some need for some kind of government. And, uh, of course, we know one day the government will be upon his shoulder. That'll be the best kind of government. But uh, there's, there's an overthrow at the moment of, and, and this, this lack of authority. And really this crumbling, chaotic world has got a crying need for authority. People are looking for something they can believe, they can stand on, they can follow. And... And we have need of something that we can be accountable to. You know, it helps us to have someone that we're accountable to. As a, as a little child, we're accountable to our mum, our dad. You know, we, we've got to have someone that we answer to, that we've, there's someone that, something that holds us steady and, and sure. There's something we know where we stand. And in contrast to this chaotic culture at the moment, we have the Bible, the Word of God. And we've got a sure confidence in this book. We've got a sure confidence... God has given us the Bible. And this book is more than just a great book. The Bible is the word of Almighty God. It is God's book. You you could put a sticker on on it if you were selling one, read the Bible, free gift inside. Amen. Isn't that true? There's a free gift inside, the free gift of God's salvation. And we can trust his word. We can have faith in what it says. And I'm going to touch on a few scriptures that we probably won't be able to look all of them up, but Romans 10 is one that is a good starting point. It says in Romans 10 verse 17 that we can trust his word. We can have faith in what he says, in the message of what he says. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10. Verse 17, faith, faith is that starting point. We have a book we can believe in. We can know it's assuredly it's true and trust it. We have God's word on it. It is truth, truth you can believe in. You know, as we know, as I've mentioned of late, that what do they still say in the courts, you know, I swear by the, <laughs> to tell, no, and, and from, well, actually for myself, we know, and this is my own conviction, others might have a different conviction, but, I had to go to court lately. I was a, a witness of something or other, and, um, and they said, uh, would you like to swear on the Bible? They thought being a minister, that that would be the natural thing to do. I said, well, actually, I believe what it says, and Jesus says, swear not at all, so I'm just going to give an affirmation. I said, let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. We don't swear by the Bible. Jesus says, don't swear by anything, not even on the Bible. But nevertheless, they do say, this, uh, I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Mind you, they gave me a good news Bible. <laughs> I was almost going to say, oh, that's not really a Bible. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, we have the Bible and it's true. Amen? That's the point I'm making. It's truth. Truth you can believe in. It's God's book for man. And you can know that. You can know that for sure. Now, mind you, the, the good news Bible, it helped me as a younger Christian. But nevertheless, we have the Bible. We believe it, we trust it, and we honour it. And we know that it's true. God's word, it is the final authority for life. And you know what? The devil hates the Bible, doesn't he? He hates it. He always has hated the word of God. He's hated it right from the beginning when he first showed his ugly face in Genesis 3. But the message of this book is life-changing. That's why he hates the book. He hates this book because this book changes lives. It changes hearts. It changes eternities. It's been said the Bible breaks hard hearts and heals broken hearts. This book can touch your heart and set you free, the message of it. And there's a battle, and it started in Genesis 3, a real battle between the master of deception, the father of lies, and God's unfailing truth. And it began in Genesis chapter 3. You might want to turn there, Genesis 3, the the third chapter of your Bible. Genesis 3, verse 1. It's when the devil first showed his uh, face, as it were, in the form of the serpent. And it says, now the serpent was more subtle 
than any, any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto them, Yea, hath God said. <laughs> now can you imagine this serpent. Yea, hath God said. <laughs> hath God said. He shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now he was casting doubt on the Bible. He was casting doubt on the voice of God, on the word of God, on the words of God right back then. And the fight started and the fight is on. The battle rages today. The enemy of our soul is committed. He hates the Bible. He hates the word of God. And there's a, there's a battle that's going on. It started way back then. At the beginning, a spiritual warfare. And of course, what does the Bible say for you that are Christian soldiers? What is the Bible? The sword of the Spirit. The devil doesn't want you to have a sword in your hand. He'd rather you have a butter knife or, or some other thing that you make of your own making. But there's a sword you can have, a sword that is sharp, two-edged sword. And the devil doesn't want you to have a sword in your hand or in your heart. It's been said that the Satan's attacks uh, even the integrity and reliability of the most important piece of weaponry with which we are to fight the enemy. Imagine if you were a soldier and you, and you were given some defective weapon that wouldn't uh, hold the, uh, the, the test of a battle. The devil doesn't want you to have this important piece of weaponry in your hand. And this quote goes on, how do we intend to win the battle when we go into the fight with our main weapon taken away or replaced with a faulty, unreliable substitute? I can assure you that you can have confidence in the book. You can have confidence in the book. And what can we know about the Bible? I put to you these things we'll talk through. Firstly, it's perfect. The Bible is perfect. Psalm 19, verse 7. Psalm 19, you might want to flick there, Psalms, the 19th Psalm. The whole Psalms really uh, refers to the Word of God. Well, in, in particular, um, Psalm 119, but we know Psalm 19 has got some telling words about the Word of God as well. And you could do well to, to read the whole Psalm, of course. Time limits us from giving this a really in-depth study. And I know the question was raised on uh, Wednesday night, you know, why the King James Bible, why not some other Bible? I'm not going to labour the point so much about why the King James Bible. That's a much more, it's a much more in-depth subject and I want to do it justice by doing that on a study night where we'll go through it and I'll put to you some reasoned arguments why the King James Bible versus some other Bibles. I'm not so much labouring that point today, but I do believe the King James Bible is the authoritative Bible for us today. But um, I'm just talking broadly on the theme of the Bible, the Bible as per, the, the Bible, generally speaking, the Bible. And so Psalm 19 verse 7 says that the Bible, the Word of God, is perfect. We see that in Psalm 19 verse 7. It says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's book says that this book is perfect. It's perfect. Is it possible to hold in our hands today a Bible, a Bible that we can assuredly say is perfect? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Otherwise, God wouldn't have said it. Yes, it is. Yes, we can. And yes, it is perfect. We hold the Bible to be infallible, inerrant, Without error, there's nothing false, it's true, it's right, altogether, from cover to cover. Satan wants to cast doubt about a perfect Bible. He doesn't want you to believe that you've got a perfect Bible in your hands. Now, we know it's a fact that some Bibles have notes that cast doubt upon the words. And why so? Why? It, it does generate that sense of, oh, what do I do? What's right, what's not right? Now, of course, the King James Bible does also have margin references and it gives an alternate rendition. But these notes in some Bibles are, are casting a doubt upon the veracity of the Word of God. That's, that's an issue, I believe. Um, it's always been Satan's way right from the start 
has God said? You know, should we question it? Why do we actually say no? It's in black and white and red. (laughs) It's the word of God. It's true. It's perfect. Now, the serpent of Genesis 3 is alike to some modern translators who approach the scriptures in scepticism. They're coming from a position of scepticism. Now, why can I find some fault or error or, oh, it's better rendered this or that or, or, you know, the Greek says or whatever it be and tries to kind of cast doubt in people's minds. Now, I'm not against going to the Greek and getting information and getting uh, further shades of meaning. It's like you go to commentaries, you go to other sources. There's, there's some value in, in research, in, in checking widely, but we know these are the words that we know are perfect words. It's a grave sin to treat the word of God as, as something to trifle with, from, to, come, to approach it from a, a position of doubt. We approach the word of God from a position of faith, not doubt. In Jeremiah 23, 26, we read of the Lord condemning such as would trifle with the word of God, as if it's some book that we can kind of just change things, cross things out, rewrite, delete, add, or just change the whole meaning, you know, paraphrase it such that it's uh, just nothing like what it says anymore. And in Jeremiah 23, 26, the Lord condemns such. He says, ye have perverted the words of the living God. That's a dangerous, that's dangerous ground, isn't it? That's thin ice to pervert the words of the living God. Now, of course, the Bible says not to add, to delete, not to, you know, and, and there's a very serious warning at the back of Revelation. Uh, it's serious to trifle with these words. We can have faith. I put to you today, brother, sister, you can have faith that you have a perfect Bible. God says his word is perfect. He says so. We believe what he says. This Bible is infallible, it's reliable, it's accurate, it's authentic. Secondly, we can have a Bible that is pure. A Bible that is pure. If you go to Psalm 119, Psalm 119, as I say, it's a a psalm that is jam-packed with blessings that flow from the word of God, from the study of it, from the faith in these words, the challenge of the word of God to our soul. And Psalm 119 verse 140 says this, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Thy word is very pure. Psalm 119 verse 140. Go to Proverbs 30. We can have a Bible where we can know every word is pure. Psalm 30 verse 5. Psalm 30 verse 5. It says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. The writer of Proverbs says, Every word of God is pure. Wow, isn't that a blessing? And you can trust It says, the Bible is the word of God from cover to cover. It has the words of God, all the words of God. You know, (laughs) the cover from cover to cover, even the cover's inspired, it says, holy Bible. (laughs) Its cover is, it's the word of God, it's from cover to cover, it's true. It's true for your soul. You can take heart in these very words for your soul. For your salvation, every word of God is pure. It has the words of God, all the words of God. Now, the opposite of pure is adulterated. You know, watered down, diluted, got some mixture to it. Um, I mean, who's got a purer tap at home? (laughs) You don't want to get you want to get all those uh, grievies out of the water, don't you? All of the chemicals, much as that doesn't anyway. But that sense of pure water—you want something that's pure. You want something that oh, that tastes good. Oh, beautiful! Look at that. Mmm, Adelaide water. Oh, beautiful. (laughs) It's pure. It's got a sense of. A, a crystal clear, fresh stream. Who loves going and seeing the waterfalls flowing down and, 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 the, and the water bubbling and streaming and splashing and, and flowing down? Just like the, when you get to the top of the mountain, the water is pure, isn't it? As you get lower down, 
animals play with it and uh, <laughs> it doesn't get so pure. It gets contaminated, doesn't it? Then you get uh, factories putting their pipes into it. <laughs> you get to the uh, bottom of that stream, it's not very nice to drink, you know. And I'm putting to you that uh, the Bible says it is pure. It is pure, as pure water, something that you'd want to drink. It's not been contaminated. Now, my position really is there's two streams of Bible manuscripts for the New Testament. One stream is pure, and the other stream is not so pure. Um, now, this is a big subject. We don't have time to cover it and do it justice, as I say, but and I'd love to share more. You might dispute with me, and I'm welcome to, I welcome to, to share you more about this and refer more information to you. And I know it's a big subject, and men of God have argued and, and still argue, and there's some on one side and some on the other. I'm not saying that every Christian who disputes this is, is um, necessarily... Uh, destined for hell or anything like that. But the Bible talks about um, the, the Bible is pure. And I put to you, as I understand it, as I've seen from what I've read, there's basically two streams of manuscripts, more or less. There's what's called the Textus Receptus, which is the received text. And that is the Bible text that underlies our New Testament in the King James Bible. Uh, the, it's called the received text. And this text came from a place called Antioch, Syria. And Acts 11.26, it says that is where the disciples were first called Christians. So it's got a heritage. There's, a, there's something special about Antioch, where the, disciples were, where the disciples were first called Christians. In Acts 11, verse 26, where Paul and Barnabas preached the word of God for a whole year. And history tells us that the received text has been the universal text, the worldwide text, essentially, for many hundreds of years. And 95%, 95%, that's a big, that's a big word here, 95% of all evidence supports this text. The, the faithful church of God largely has stood with this very text. It's the very text, essentially the very text that underlies the King James Bible. And I put to you, this is a pure stream. This is the stream of manuscripts that 95% of the manuscripts endorse this stream of texts. The alternative is the 5%, which disagree with themselves as well. And I put to you that they are not, as I, as I can perceive it, they are not that pure stream of text. But that's probably, a, as I say, it's a little bit of an aside. We can't give that full justice today in this short message. But I put to you that you can know that your Bible is pure, that it's from a pure stream of manuscripts. It's been translated from a text basis that is pure, and faithfully translated by godly men. The, the scholars of that day, not just intellectual and language scholars, but godly scholars who believed it, translated it for us today. And people have shed their blood for us to have this in our English language today. It's pure. The, the Bible tells how the opposite of pure is corrupt, you, you could say too. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17, and you've got to look at this in the King James to get the right rendition, it's 2 Corinthians 2 17. It talks about men who will try and corrupt the word of God, corrupt it. Our Bible is not contaminated or corrupt, it is pure, as God says it is. And Peter urged the new Christians in 1 Peter 2, he says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Sincere has got the sense of it's not contaminated, it's, it's pure, it, it's, it, it's the truth, it's not got tainted, it's not corrupted. And Peter urges them, he says, to desire it, desire this. He, he urges us, likewise in our day, get an appetite for the word of God. Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah 15 verse 16. Jeremiah 15 verse 16. Jeremiah the prophet says, Thy words were found, 
and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah says, I found the words and I ate them, and it was the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, you can eat this book. Isn't that a great thought? That you could get such a voracious appetite if you could get hungry for God, that this would feed that hunger deep down inside you. Get an appetite for the word of God. It's been said a well-read Bible is a sign of a well-fed soul. God's word is pure and it is sweet to your soul. It says in the word, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 119, 103, it says, Psalm 119, 103, it says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Don't you love honey? You know, I'm married to a honey. She's sweet most of the time. <laughs> but no, the, the, these words are sweet, as sweeter than the honey, sweeter than honey to your soul, to your mouth. And this is our spiritual, she's always sweet. This is our spiritual food source, isn't it? Our spiritual food source. Let's not treat it like snack food. You know, I've got, some, I've got a bag of snack food on my desk and I like to have a nibble here and there. Let's not treat the word of God like that. We just sort of snack on it. Let's try to make a deliberate intent to make it our daily bread. Amen? So it's pure. Uh, now, I've got to keep moving here. Uh, Matthew 4, verse 4, our Lord was speaking to Satan and he says, when Satan was attacking, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's Matthew 4. Verse 4, 4, 4. It's interesting, Luke 4, verse 4, it's got the very same word, uh, in a sense, in, in essentially, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. It's interesting that modern Bibles take out but by every word of God in Luke 4, verse 4. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Why would they take that out? Because the devil doesn't want you to have it. The devil doesn't want you to have every word of God. He just wants you to have maybe bits and pieces of it, that then you doubt, what is it? Friends, we live by this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word matters. Every word. It is perfect. It is pure. And it is preserved. The word of God is preserved. Now, if you look in your cupboard and look at the fine print on some of the items in your pantry, it says there's preservatives added. This, is, this has got preservatives. This is preserved. It can't go off. It can't, it can't grow such that it goes stale or mouldy or, or out of date. Uh, it's not got an expiry date, a use-by date. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's no, no use-by date. It will forever be. It will forever more endure. It's preserved. And God has pr promised that he will preserve his word. You see that in Psalm 12, verse 6 through 7. Now, some try to change this one too. But Psalm 12, verses 6 through 7 tells us about the preserve, preservation of the word of God. It's pure and it is preserved. Psalm 12, verse 6 through 7, it says this. The words of the Lord are pure words. There we see pure again. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, very pure. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's pure and it is preserved. God promises to preserve his word. Isn't that good? This book is preserved. It's kept by God's grace. It's kept for us. It's as contemporary as it ever was. It's as relevant as it ever will be. And Psalm 100, Psalm 100 verse 5 says, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I'd like to think that generations from me, uh, you know, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, when, if and when that may happen, that the truth will endure to them. They'll have it still. They'll have it when I'm long dead and gone and we're eaten by worms. My children will have the truth because the truth will endure forever forever it will not stop and the lord promises that his word will endure it will not fail 
Our Lord says this in Matthew 24, 35. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. He says that. His words shall not pass away. So, friends, I put to you, we have his word, nothing more, nothing less, and no mistakes. He's provided it. He's preserved it for us. Also, we see this book is powerful. We're halfway through. You see where we're up to here. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. This book is powerful. There's no other book like it. It's unique. It's beyond compare. There's no comparison. And there's some that would make claims of being a holy book that is written by one man or, or even after his death, I'm uh, told, uh, and, and just collected and, and just a mishmash and, and conflicting with itself. Uh, and then we've got latter-day prophets who tell us about books or prophecies, so-called, and it's all just a confusion, a confusing mess. Now, this book was written, 66 books really, by multiple authors over a massive time span and it agrees in unity. It is powerful. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says this, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the joints and marrows and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I read that wrong there, sorry. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's quick and powerful, friends. Friends, I put to you today that this book has power, has authority beyond any other book. And it has soul-saving power. This is the one book that tells us of salvation, of the message of the gospel. Romans 1 verse 16. Really, the gospel's right through from Genesis it's, it's right through the whole book. It's weaved in and out, the theme, the scarlet cord, the thread of the gospel of the blood, of the saving grace, of God's saving. It's one big gospel, in a way, the good news. Romans 1.16 tells us, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Friends, God's word is powerful. There's nothing like it. God's word has the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. This gospel, this news of his saving, his salvation, can be received by anyone who believes this message. It's got power to save your soul. Friends, this is jam-packed with God's dynamite power, hasn't it? Powerful, powerful. Wow, it's almost too hot to handle. It's, it's alive. It's quick. It's powerful. Whew. And it's, it's too dangerous. This is a dangerous book. They ban this book, don't they? There's some countries, there's some uh, kings and dictators that hate this book so much that if it were to be found in your possession, you're dead meat. You're gone. This book is powerful. That's why they hate it so much. It's revolutionary. Revolutionary, yes. Amen. Praise God. So let's go. It's powerful. And we're getting to the next one here. His word is precious. It's precious. 2 Peter 1 verse 4 tells you that you've got some precious, something precious in your hands here. In 2 Peter 1 verse 4, Something precious means it's, it's got a rare quality, hasn't it? It's, it's just something, if you go mining in the ground, uh, you know, I like to, to think every time I'm digging a hole in my backyard, I'm going to strike that nugget one day. But it's so precious, it's so rare, it's going to take me a few lifetimes to find it, you know. And this is the, the word of God, it's so precious, it's so rare. It's just this is something, wow, if you find it, this is treasure, isn't it? It's, it's more than all, all my mum and dad's uh, money that they've got hidden under the mattress at home and, and all, that, uh, all, all, that, uh, all those gold ingots that Rodney's got in the safe uh, at the farm there. It's, this is more precious. It's more precious than anything beyond compare, beyond anything you can measure in earthly fashion. And it says this in 2 Peter 1 verse 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious. 
promises. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Exceeding, great and precious promises. Who's had someone promise you something and they haven't delivered? Whoa, I could, uh, there's a few that I could think of. People have uh, had bad experiences. <laughs> I know I've mentioned it before. Someone that wanted to do a job for me and he said, oh, if you buy the materials first, uh, and then I bought them, I gave him the money. And I couldn't, his phone just seemed to stop working. <laughs> I couldn't find him anymore. I was giving him quite a bit of substantial money ahead of the job. Oh, how strange, he's not contactable anymore. He must have changed his phone number. And, and he promised me, and he broke his promise. You know, let God be true and every man a liar. He's the one. He will never break his promises. He will never, ever break his promises. He is very, very true. He will never let you down. He will never fail you. His promises are yea and amen. They are yes, absolutely, 100% guaranteed. And this book has got precious promises, precious. And this book promises eternal life, eternal life. Promises a relationship with God. 1 Samuel 3 verse 1 tells how uh, Samuel was there before Eli and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. It's like it was something, it was a rare commodity. And it still is today, isn't it? This is so precious that many people live a whole lifetime without ever finding it. How sad to miss that, to miss that. The precious promises, to miss the promise of heaven, to miss that precious promise. What a sad state that would be. It's like a rare jewel. You know, those, those precious jewels you've got, ladies, this, this is more rare and precious and wonderful. It's not common or ordinary. It's supernatural and of immense value. Why so? Because the Bible exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. John 5.39, he says, Search ye the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, says our Lord. Search the scriptures, he says. And we know God's sure word would not denigrate our Lord Jesus, but would raise him up. The, the true word of God does not denigrate the deity of Christ. It elevates him. It exalts the Lord Jesus. It exalts his deity, his virgin birth, his blood atonement. You've got a Bible that's taking the blood out. It's, it's doubtful, isn't it? I think God would elevate the blood. I think God would elevate the name of Jesus, not take his name out. And, and, and such truths as that, many doctrines, uh, that the true word of God, it is precious. It elevates the one who is precious unto you that believe he is precious. And the Lord gives the uh, Bible gives the Lord Jesus Christ his rightful place, his preeminency. And 1 Peter 1 23, it says that the word of God is so precious that it brings salvation. This is so precious that we must impart it. You know, if you had some uh, capacity, uh, if you had some great treasure, wouldn't you want to give it to someone who needed it? And there's people that are in spiritual poverty that, that need this so vitally. It's important. It's more important than any other message, than any other, anything you could imagine. You know, if you're into marketing and you really believed in what you were marketing, you know, I used to be a, I used to do door-to-door -door canvassing, you know, and convince people at the doorstep to, to uh, get a quote for insulation or whatever it be, or, um, you know, different things such as that. And uh, you had to believe in your product. This is going to help you. This is going to help keep your house insulated. It's going to save you money. Look, this is, this, um, it's a very poor comparison here, but you know, how much more, as in a product to market, um, it's, it's not a good comparison really, but, but this message this mandate that we have this one that we want to tell others of he is just the greatest and most important one to share this message of salvation it should be burning in our hearts we cannot contain ourselves but share it and it tells us 1 peter 1 23 tells us that we're born again of this corruptible uh, not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible 
by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the gospel which, uh, sorry, this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So it's so precious it brings salvation. You know, there's no greater message you can impart to another soul. And to know, really, what's the, what can we take to heaven with us? It's really only those who have been introduced to Christ, isn't it? That's, it's only those you've introduced to Christ you can take to heaven with you. You can't take any material goods or anything of substance down here below. It's only those you've reached and, and, and bring with you, as it were, to heaven. To tell others, to bring them with you. The people you love and care about, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. So we see the word of God is perfect, it's pure, it's preserved, it's powerful, it's precious. And lastly, it's profitable. As we read at the start, it's, it's profitable. 2 Timothy 3.16, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Friends, this book is profitable. If you want to, if you want to get rich, if you want to have a, have a profitable life, that at the end of your life, when you're old and grey like me, and you look back at what have you done, there'll be something, something of substance, something, something of eternal benefit, of, something of eternal profit for your soul and for others. There's great benefit for you to, to heed these words of life. You know, young men, young women, there's a good Bible school on the wall there. Study the Bible. It's a good time. If you're younger, you know, if you're older, there's no time limit. The ministry has got no time constraint. You know, don't, you don't really retire. You've got a lifetime. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. As I say, there's a recommended Bible school. You can do it online. I urge you today, friends, to have faith in this tremendous book. It will be of such great value to your soul. And it's great subject. This is beyond compare. This book is full of blessings, blessings you want to share, blessings you want to heed and, and look upon, to find and look upon. It will profit you. Now, I could tell you of some schemes to get rich, and uh, I'm still trying to find one <laughs> that works. <laughs> the sense of, you know, we could spend a lifetime trying to uh, be materially wealthy, but how much more, how much more the benefit of your soul to be wealthy on the inside, to be profiting from this. This will benefit you for time and eternity if you will read it and heed it. And I quote just in closing here, it is called the Word, the Word of God, the Word of Christ. The word of truth, the holy scriptures, the scripture of truth, the law of the Lord, the sword of the spirit, the oracles of God. It is pure, perfect, true, precious, quick and powerful. It was written for our instruction and intended for our use. The word of God is regenerating, quickening, illuminating. It's able to convert the soul. It's able to make the simple wise. It's sanctifying, it's faith producing, it's hope producing. It's obedience producing. It's able to cleanse the heart, able to cleanse the way, able to keep us from a destructive path, admonishing, comforting, heart rejoicing. The Bible, it should be our standard. It should be believed, appealed to, read, known, searched, received, memorised, taught to our children, spoken of continually, not handled deceitfully, should be obeyed. And as a Christian, you should love it exceedingly delight in it, regard it as sweet, esteem it as above all things, long after it, stand in awe of it, keep it in remembrance, hide it in your hearts, meditate in it, rejoice in it, trust in it, obey it and speak of it, end quote. Now, the story is told of several pastors who were arguing over which Bible translation was the best. And one of the pastors startled the group with the declaration, my grandmother's translation is the best I've ever read. And when his colleagues exclaimed, what, your grandmother translated the Bible? She said, he said, yes, she translated the Bible into her life. Amen. And it was the most powerful translation I've ever seen. 
Is the Bible translated into your life? You know, it's been said, you're the only gospel some people will ever read. They won't open the pages, but they'll read you. They'll see what you're, whether you're fair dinkum or not. And friends, the Bible, put it into action. James says, don't just be hearers of it, be doers of it. Do it. Receive the one of whom it speaks, the saviour of your soul, and know his saving today. I urge you today, we know the word of God is perfect. It's flawless. It's pure. It's not some mixture. It's pure. It's fresh. It's preserved. It's kept by God. Sound from cover to cover. It's powerful. This will transform your heart and soul, your lifestyle. It's precious. There's precious promises and they're for you. Exceeding great and precious promises. And it's profitable. It's profitable in every dimension of life for your Christian walk, for your salvation. You can be wise unto salvation. You can be born again of this seed that will germinate in your heart and produce a a wonderful plant, a a growing, vibrant, fresh Christian. And look, I know there's different convictions on some of these things that I've talked about today. Nevertheless, I put to you, we can have faith that there is a Bible that is sure it is sure more sure word of prophecy this is the book and i urge you to it but not just to have a a theological concept of it or a an intellectual grasp of it not that that's probably possible this side of heaven but that the holy spirit will quicken it to your heart that that these things are spiritually discerned that essentially you know the author of this book that he is your savior and that you trust in him i urge you to that Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Love it. Pay attention to it. Take time. Find ways of hearing it. Whether audibly, there's many means you can take audio um, messages and put it in your technology to make such that you can hear it playing in in your background while you're working, if that is possible where you work. So friends, be encouraged in this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God and the word was God. And the word dwelt amongst us. The word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Lord Jesus, that you came as the very word, the living word. And Lord, you've given us... uh, assurance that your word is true and we believe you and lord not just to believe it in our head but in our heart and to know you the author of this book as our living savior lord we pray for each one hearing this would take that step of faith that faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of god that we believe you the writer the author the instigator of this book or the author of our salvation lord uh, you are the one who will author it and finish it And Lord, we pray for any hearing this that have yet to trust you, they'll see, as we heard earlier, of the the work of the cross, of, of your precious gift of love at the cross in the person of your son, that we can know you're saving today as we trust in you, trust in you now for time and for eternity. Lord, and we can believe your word. Help us to study it. Help us to research these things such that we can be wise and careful about these matters that are very important. And Lord, not to trifle at your word, but to take it very much to heart. And Lord, most of all, that it would work on the inside of us, that it will be an engrafted word that implants it even in our hearts, Lord, that's such that this word will be like a seed. And uh, as we know, we are born again by it. And Lord, we have new life as we grow in the knowledge and the obedience to it, Lord, that we'll be a stronger Christian for it. We can grow thereby. And uh, we pray, encourage each one, Lord, today in these things and and may each one know the comfort of your scriptures too that encouragement that it is in in these chaotic days that there is solid ground we can stand upon and know your keeping and saving power in jesus name amen amen